West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Steal the election. A district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, is requesting a special grand jury in her investigation of Donald Trump. And there's a bombshell new report from The Washington Post revealing that Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani coordinated the scheme to forge documents to submit illegitimate electors from multiple states. Those falsified certificates later became a pretense to throw out Biden's legitimate electoral votes. Well, we begin the readout tonight with the select committee's letter today asking Donald Trump's daughter and former White House aide Ivanka Trump to testify voluntarily before their committee. That letter is not just a scathing indictment of the former first daughter who never had any business, frankly, being in government, no matter who her daddy was. It also paints a devastating picture of how Trump stood in the way of real action as the country he was sworn to protect fell under attack. The committee made clear they're interested in a phone call between Trump and Vice President Pence on the morning of January 6th, which Ivanka and General Keith Kellogg both witnessed in the Oval Office. They reveal that in earlier testimony, General Kellogg confirmed that Trump pushed Pence to reject Biden's electors. If you don't do it, I picked the wrong man four years ago. You're going to wimp out, he reportedly said. Then at the close of that call, Kellogg says... Ivanka Trump turned to me and said, Mike Pence is a good man. I said, yes, he is. In other words, Ivanka was praising Pence at the same time Pence was resisting her father's unconstitutional demands. It suggests that she knew Trump's plan to steal the election was wrong, despite the quack legal theories from people like John Eastman and Jenna Ellis. Of course, Trump chose to embrace those bizarre theories, tweeting on January 5th, and on January 6th, that the vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors and encouraging him to, quote, send them back to the state so that he would remain president. Those claims were not only false and would have amounted to a coup, but they also put a target on Pence's back during the Capitol siege. On the former point, the committee says they have information suggesting that Trump's White House counsel may have concluded that the direction Trump was giving Pence would violate the Constitution or would otherwise be illegal. The committee also wants to ask Ivanka why Trump issued a tweet at 2.24 p.m. after it was widely reported that violence had broken out as Trump crazed goons roamed the Capitol chanting, hang Mike Pence and even bringing a noose. That's the tweet where Trump said Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. And it was like throwing gasoline on a fire. The timeline suggests that Trump likely knew what impact his words would have on that already violent crowd. And the committee says that they have evidence that this tweet ignited a frenzy. But when Trump was asked to stop the violence, the president was, according to one account, stubborn 
and staff recognize that Ivanka may be the only person who could persuade him to act. One exchange paints a devastating picture of the disarray in the White House. A text to a staffer asks, is someone going to POTUS? He has to tell protesters to dissipate. Someone is going to get killed. A staffer responds, I've been trying for the last 30 minutes. It's completely insane. Additionally, the committee suggests that even Ivanka, who's supposedly the person with the most influence over Trump, had difficulty persuading her father to act. When Trump finally did agree to at least put out a video, multiple takes were filmed but not utilized. And the evidence suggests that that's because Trump failed in the initial clips to actually ask the rioters to leave the Capitol. Furthermore, the committee reveals that the former acting secretary of defense has testified under oath that Trump never contacted him at any time on January 6th and never at any time issued him any order to deploy the National Guard. Joining me now, Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor, and Michael Cohen, former personal attorney to Donald Trump and host of the Mia Couple podcast. And Michael, I want to start with you. Ivanka Trump, talk about her influence is it accurate to believe that if anyone could have talked Trump down, she would have been the one to do it? We have video of her uh, at the ellipse where she was there uh, on that day with Donald Trump. Could she have talked him down in your view? And would he have put forward or come to believe a scheme to stay in power without telling her? So the answer to that is absolutely not. People overestimate Ivanka's, we'll call it control over Donald. Nobody has control over Donald, not even Donald himself. And so the notion that just Ivanka sitting there in the office, uh, in the dining room off of the Oval Office saying, Daddy, Daddy, this needs to stop. Someone's going to get killed. We already know this to be true. There's more than at least 300 people who have testified to the um to the committee the january 6th committee we already know all of this stuff we have the text messages you have the emails you have the verbal uh depositions of these individuals i understand the point about taking this investigation slow making sure that it sticks making sure that donald and his cohorts don't get a chance to slip away that it needs to be rock solid but i'm sure just like all the you know your viewers right now we'd like to see it move just a tad bit faster yeah because you know it's hard to get away from glenn the the the, the, the kind of common sense evidence that lots of people understood that Donald Trump himself believed and understood that there was a plan that in his mind could allow him to stay president. We have a letter from a Freedom Caucus member, we don't know who it is, objecting before January 6th to this plan. In the days before, according to the reporting, a member of the House Freedom Caucus, these are the right wingers, these are the Tea Partiers, who had knowledge of the president's planning for that day sent a message to the White House Chief of Staff with this explicit warning. If POTUS allows this to occur, we're driving a stake in the heart of the federal Republic. The letter also says that after the insurrection, Sean Hannity, who's extremely influential over Trump, Trump watches the show every day, hired his former EP to be his comms leader. Sean Hannity texts, texts Kaylee McEnany, laying out the five point approach for conversations with Trump. It says no more stolen election talk, impeachment, and even the 25th Amendment talk are real. Many people will quit. McEnany replies, Love that. Thank you. This is the playbook. I'll help it reinforce. And now you've got this Giuliani news that he's the one coordinating the plan to have these fake electors submitted. How do you possibly ignore this if you're in the DOJ? Let's hope the DOJ is not ignoring it, Joy. I know that we hear a rising chorus of voices, people saying, we don't see any outward manifestation of a criminal investigation being conducted by the Department of Justice. But I don't think that means we can leap to the conclusion that there is no criminal investigation being conducted by the Department of Justice. I do not believe, I can't conceive of the Department of Justice ignoring the crime that we have seen in the harsh light of day. The frustration and the anxiety that we are all experiencing is we saw the crime, we know who the criminals are, and we have yet to see any accountability. That's what has us so frustrated. Now, Ivanka is the latest in a long line of people that we know have incriminating information about Donald Trump's conduct. The House Select Committee wants to hear from her, and that's good. So, and, and I have to believe that the request 
for evidence and information and testimony is a precursor to a subpoena for the same from the House Select Committee if she refuses to provide information voluntarily. And I think there's just one question that Ivanka has to ask herself. Do I want to be a patriot moving forward through the rest of my life or do I want to be part of the cover up of my father's crimes? And if she opts not to provide information that she has and that is not privileged, there's no daddy daughter privilege in the law, then she will become a member of the cover up club together with Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, Scott Perry and anybody else who is refusing to provide incriminating information about Donald Trump. There's a term for that. It's called a cover up. And Ivanka is going to have a choice to make. And you know what? If she makes the wrong choice, I hope we eventually see the Department of Justice not only taking down all of the folks who are culpably responsible for the attack on the Capitol, but the people who covered it up. Well, Michael, you know these people. Which which one is she? Yeah, she's not she's not going to go in and testify so far. What Trump and this group of cohorts have elected to do is to basically show the American people that you don't have to comply with these congressional subpoenas. So far, we've seen how many people do it. They just choose not to show up. And then right now, um, you know, they're supposed to then refer it to the DOJ for, um, you know, for further action. I unfortunately believe that the January 6th committee, that the DOJ is waiting for the January 6th committee to refer it to the DOJ for criminal indictments. You know, how many more months, how many more people do we have to listen to when you already, as Glenn just appropriately and accurately stated, we already know, we saw it with our own eyes. We heard it with our own ears. People die. They attacked the Capitol. They attacked the police officers, our, our Capitol Police. This was a coup. Anybody that doesn't think that it's a coup is a kook. It is Friday, the 21st of January of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Well, I apologize for uh, not having a show the last two days. As some of you may know from the public announcements that uh, uh, were distributed on social media, I had uh, a bit of an issue with pain. Yes, a bit. And it was so painful, I was not able to sit and do an hour show. And uh, so I I apologize for that. I just could not do it. It was just too uncomfortable. And uh, I I had to go to the doctor. And I did. And um, I guess I'll just give you a little bit of background on my medical conditions. My comorbidities, as they might say. I don't really have any except uh, some structural issues that uh, came about because of my involvement in sports. Damn it. Yeah, I've had four knee surgeries, two on each knee, and I've had a couple of shoulder surgeries too, and you know, just when you're out there running as fast as you can, right into somebody who's moving, you know, pretty much as fast as they can too, it hurts or can. (laughs) <laughs> over time, they never tell you. They never tell you. I do remember them saying, give your body up for the team. Well, you know what? Uh, where's the team now? <laughs> yeah, I gave up my body. I gave my body to the team. And now we all suffer. It's a weird thing in America, isn't it? Get injured in high school and college, and the next thing you know, when you're an old person, it just is not good. So I have arthritis, uh, severe arthritis, apparently, in both knees. I had a torn ACL in my left knee, and that was uh, operated on with modern procedures. My right knee, I tore the collateral and uh, lateral. Well, I, I pulled the ligaments on both sides of my knee. How's that? Medial and and collateral. And I also 
damage the meniscus, the medial and collateral meniscus. Is that it? Right. The, the 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 little buffer, the bumper there between your lower leg and upper leg, right there on both sides of your knee capsule. And back in the day when I injured that, they did not believe that cartilage, meniscus, was live tissue. They thought it was dead tissue. They didn't believe it had a blood source. So therefore, it's not, you know, it's just a bone. Take it out. And so they did. So I have no cartilages in my right knee. Fortunately, on the left knee where I had damaged the meniscus, you know, they kept uh, the healthy part in, which was nice. But I still have a partial tear of the ACL in that knee, and that has been an issue. So the way that my body works, and maybe your body works the same way, um, when you get injured, you sort of lean over on the other side. Mm -hmm. Sort of compensate. And that's been the story of my life. My body's been compensating. I guess you could say I've been compensating. Ooh. Anyway, it's been compensating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I injure the right side, and I take everything over on the left side. I wear the left side out, then I take it back over on the right side. That gets worn out, and I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I did something with my right knee. I suspect I have an idea of what happened. My mom started to take a tumble off her bed. And I got to tell you, it's not easy getting my mom up off the floor. So I don't want her to go to the floor. <laughs> so I kind of caught her, got my arms underneath her shoulders, uh, you know, underneath her underarms, and gave her some support and lifted her up so she wouldn't go to the ground. Uh, she was like falling out of bed. I asked her, to, uh, you know, can you, can you scoot your butt over and swing your legs around? So she scooted her butt off the bed. <laughs> Mom, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> so I think that uh, when I caught her, and though my mom's, you know, in her mid 80s, and she's she's pretty solid. I got to tell you, she's she's like um, one of those white dwarf stars. You know, it doesn't seem very big, but there's a lot of mass there. So uh, uh, I caught her and I think that I bounced uh, the bone on bone in my knee and it got swollen over time and just got so unbearable on Wednesday I got up well actually that whole night I slept fitfully if I slept at all and it just was hurting like the dickens so I took a couple of a set of metaphenes didn't really work I put some ice on it didn't really work and it was hot. It felt hot to me. So I was a bit worried because I've had cellulitis before. Now, even though it's been quite a while, I mean, years and years and years and years, uh, I, I guess I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't worry about it. But I was a bit. I was wondering if I had some sort of, you know, bloodstream infection. You don't want that. And you don't ever know. I mean, infections can arise from a cut behind your ear and show up uh, somewhere else in your heart. It's happened. So I was a bit concerned about that, but I'm pretty sure that I, it was a bone-on-bone -bone thing. Um, a lot of times I will say that when I do that, uh, it, it, it usually puts me in my butt right now. But I think I kind of wore it out anyway in the couple of days after that had happened. And then I started feeling, you know, my knee started feeling a little achy, shall we say. And I attributed it to the cold weather. But uh, when my right knee started hurting so bad and getting pretty swollen, too, I got to say, pretty swollen. It was really swollen. And uh, I just heard a noise, and I don't know what that was. Okay, but it got exceedingly swollen, and packing ice on it didn't really seem to do the trick, and that got to be a bit of a worry. So, um so, as I said, I did finally go to the doctor. I called up my primary, and they said get into urgent care because it was sort of, no, I wouldn't say late in the day. But uh, that's where I went, and they x-rayed it and uh, affirmed that, yeah, you have some really bad osteoarthritis there. Oh, thank you. I already know that. I try to live 
with the knowledge that it's not going to stop me. <laughs> yeah, well, this particular thing uh, incident did. It stopped me from doing the show. And I got to say, that's the first time since I've been doing even the previous iteration of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy when it was that other show <laughs> from from way back. Uh, I, the show must go on and I never let anything I mean, I had shoulder surgery. I was able to, you know, do a show. I was able to take care of the radio station. Now, granted, uh, that previous show, wink, wink, (laughs) if you get my drift, um, I had some help on the show. uh, and, And so I could do one even if I was slightly incapacitated. So um, I'd never really missed a show. I was still able to take care of the radio station to a point. I had to turn it into a robot station and play uh, all PV channel content. So I apologize for that. But, hey, we're part of the PV family and uh, we broadcast some of their shows. Not necessarily in their time frame because we are Netroots Radio. But... um, uh, I at least was able to do that. I wasn't, unfortunately, able to format the shows because everything is handcrafted here, of course. You know, we format the shows and drop in our interstitials and PSAs and whatnot. And a lot of that's handcrafted because I don't want to have a robot station. I don't want everything automated. I just, I, I don't know, just goes against my uh, freestyle programming ideas. So uh, I was able to take care of the station to a degree and let the station take care of itself for a bit. And the uh, the advice that I got from the doctor at urgent care. Uh, oh, they did prescribe me some prescription level level naproxen, 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 naproxen. I've never I, I, I keep hearing the different pronunciations from different medical professionals. So I, I like to say uh, naproxen. That's what I like to say. But I got this prescription level of that. Uh, the trademark name you may be familiar with would be Aleve. So that's one of the Naperson brands. And I also got a prescription level uh, uh, acetamin, acetaminophene, which is uh, uh, Tylenol. And that one, even though it's prescription level, you can still get that dosage over the counter. It's an apperson that you cannot get over the counter, at least my dosage level. It has helped some. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm supposed to stay off my leg. I'm supposed to keep it elevated. But I got to, you know, I tried to explain to them that, you know, my tasks here mean that I have to get around. They did say get some crutches. And I actually thought I had some crutches here, but I cannot find them. So I should pick up some crutches. He said that would take a lot of pressure off my leg when I'm, you know, doing things like, you know, standing at the stove. The idea of standing at the stove with crutches doesn't really appeal. But getting to there, that would be helpful. So I'm going to get some crutches, even though I feel weird about it. Oh, that was the other th- other thing. I had to be wheelchaired. Now, of course, we we do have a wheelchair here because of my mom. And my sister took me to urgent care, so uh, she wheelchaired me out to her her vehicle and uh, then wheelchaired me into urgent care. (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't. There was no way I could walk, you know, what, the 50 feet or so from the front door to the front gate to get into her vehicle. So there that was something. Usually I'm able to hobble around at least even with a cane. But uh, the idea of doing that, I just, I I knew I was done. So, uh, got there and got the x-rays and got the blood test because there was a bit of concern. I being a white male of a certain age, I can be susceptible to gout, which I've always attributed to a libertine lifestyle. And I'm not that libertine, I got to tell you. Uh, I watch my diet. You know, I I do eat red meat, but not a whole lot. I try to stay away from those foods that have a preponderance of uric acid uh, buildup. 
because that's how you get gout. Not that I'm thinking about, well, this is how I'm keeping from getting gout. I just like to have a moderate, healthy diet. And so I'm very conscious of that. So they gave me the blood tests and you know, for gout and any other number of things that might explain this. But the picture usually tells the tale. And uh, according or reaffirmed by the x-ray tech, the uh, physician's assistant there and the physician themselves, I have really bad osteoarthritis in that knee. Now, I know I have really bad osteoarthritis in the other knee, too. But the right one now is the one that hurts. And that was actually my good knee. Uh, because the ACL tear in the left knee uh, makes it fairly unstable. Uh, even more background, oh, well, when I first hurt my right knee was still when I was in high school, but I didn't have surgery on it until I was 21, after trying to play some college ball. Yeah, I, I actually st probably could have stayed away from football for another year, because of a severe shoulder injury that I had surgery on uh, in my junior year of high school. But, uh, you know, I was still good enough to, you know, try it for the, for the team and and uh, play a little bit, mostly on kickoff and punt, kickoff and punt returns. Uh, I was on kickoff uh, return and also kickoff uh, defense. And uh, I was a punt returner. But I like to play uh, uh, a little bit of um, defense because, uh, I don't know, I, I, th there was something fun about, like I said, something fun about running as fast as you can right into somebody. I, I kind of like that. Unbeknownst to me at the time, or maybe because I was in denial, you know, when you hit someone, you can get hurt yourself. That's why I decided, you know, I don't really like to get into fist fights because when you hit somebody in the head, it hurts your hand. You see people like hitting each other in the head in the movies. No one like stops and like shakes their hand. I mean, well, sometimes you see it, but mostly it's like, you know, they're just wheeling and dealing, but they're not really hitting each other. So, you know, hey, but in real life, uh, you hit somebody in the head with your hand, you're going to break uh, some bones in there and you will feel it. Ouch. So uh, what's different about throwing your whole body into somebody? Some, something can, you know, like break. And then they do. So, uh, yeah, kids, be careful. Moms, dads, I don't know. Maybe contact sports isn't a good idea for a while. I will say that I was actually denied the chance to play contact sports until I got into high school. Played a lot of flag football. Uh, my parents did not want me to play contact sports because they were smart. <laughs> and they know better than the kid. But the kid always thinks they know better than the parent. Isn't that weird? So, uh, uh, yeah. Just from high school and then a couple of years in college trying to play football. Ouch! Yeah. I could have just stayed with track. I was a nationally ranked pole vaulter. Pretty good quarter miler or 400 meter guy. I actually wanted to be a decathlete. I didn't do too bad in the long jump. Uh, I was uh, six foot six, six foot seven or so in the high jump as a freshman in high school. And in my sophomore year, I did the same, but I was putting more emphasis into pole vaulting at that point. Uh, good miler. I was in the low four minutes in the uh, in the mile, uh, pretty good for high schoolers. Uh, what else? I but yeah, oh, I wasn't so bad in the discus either. Uh, wasn't my uh, well, actually, that was my uh, strongest strength sport. I wasn't too good in the shot put. Had good form, but I just couldn't put it out there as far as you need to. So um, yeah, and then I wasn't too bad in the javelin either. So I was thinking that maybe I might want to be a decathlete, except for the fact that the football injuries intruded upon those plans. And it all intruded upon those plans because I thought I knew better than the doctors and that I knew better than my parents. I just knew better. Which is sort of like 
what we are experiencing now with all these childish anti-maskers, anti-vaskers, COVID denialists. They think that they know better. My sister went into uh, one of the, well, I'll just divulge it. She went into Walgreens because it was close to where urgent care was. And the pharmacy in town would have been closed by the time that we got there. And usually what happens is that, you know, when they get the prescription facts to them or even hand it off to them, they, they don't fill it right away. So it was going to be the next day. And I at least needed to get the Tylenol and something close to the dosages of the naproxen. But while my sister was in Walgreens, of course, I'm in the car. She's waiting in line. Now, she's just retired from being a nurse 20 plus years at Children's Hospital of Orange County in pediatric oncology. And it takes a special person to be able to handle that. And my sister is an angel and she is a special person and she handled that. Then she taught, uh, retired from that and taught a little bit of high school science for a bit. Got a little bored, got a little perturbed with, uh, you know, the whole administration and dealing with idiot parents because there's a lot of them out there. So she got back into medical work and put in five years in life flight. Two crashes, she decided, well, maybe she wants to live. <laughs> so when my brother-in-law retired from UPS, they found their property up here in Rogue River. And they moved up here. And she then got the job running the respiratory department at Three Rivers Asante here in Grants Pass. Put in another 20 plus years there. And at the age of 65, we finally convinced her, yeah, you can retire now for real. So here's my sister who spent 20 plus years in pediatric oncology. She's wearing a mask during a pandemic in the pharmacy part of the store where they say everybody must wear masks. And of course, she's surrounded by a bunch of idiots not wearing masks and not being quiet about everybody else who is. My sister said that it was the most vile comments. And, and my sister is the type, you know, she'll, she'll try to talk to them and reason with them. My sister is also a quite religious person. So when people start telling her she needs to read more scripture, she'll just blast some scripture right back at them. You know, so good for her. But it kind of made her a little depressed. In fact, it made her very depressed because she thinks of all the time that she put in and all the help that she gave people. And this is the thanks that she's getting by a bunch of losers who think that they know more than the doctors. They know more than any other parent. They know more than you. The know nothings know it all. That's why they're know-nothings. If they knew something, they would know that they don't know it all. But this is the world we're living in right now. You know, it's one thing when someone disagrees with you and they let you be, and it's another one that gets in your face saying, Take off that mask! You don't need that mask! And when your response is, Yes, I do, because I'm around an idiot like you. Well, my sister didn't say that. She doesn't call people idiots. She's much nicer. But when she told me that story, it did make me a bit angry. Because my sister doesn't need to go through that. Especially when she's just in there trying to get me some naproxen and Tylenol. Give me a break. Anyway, I've gone on quite a bit here. You know, we had a show all lined up for you on Wednesday. So I actually, uh, that, you know, I always uh, get ready to pre-publish and then get a... Uh, uh, clip at the top when I get up so I can get something fresh. And of course, I was in such uh, diminished capacity on Wednesday, I didn't pull the diary out from Q and it did publish sans the clip at the top. So I am uh, scavenging or salvaging some of the stories from Wednesday's show because they are still pertinent. And uh, the ones that weren't, well, they've been replaced. So we might as well get into the curated part of the show because I've gone on quite long, especially since we had quite a long clip at the top with Joy. Well, 
as uh, uh, that Michael Cohen guy said, anybody that doesn't think it's a coup is a kook. Now, I might uh, correct him in one fashion. It's not anybody that, it's anybody who. Okay, Michael, come on. All right. On the rest of the menu, <laughs> the Department of Justice is furious that Portland police and the city kept them in the dark about training material that advocated violence against Black Lives Matter protesters. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti nominated the first woman as a city's fire department chief, and the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board told the agency to stop using a misleading statistic. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where a federal judge slashed Puerto Rico's public debt load, ending the nearly five-year bankruptcy battle. And the United Nations approved a resolution condemning the denial of the Nazi Holocaust. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. really should forego the usual during this segment, since I burned up so much time, in which we make an appeal for money because we pay our bills and uh, other pertinent information that's very pertinent. We uh, are just got syndicated in a couple or a few more podcast platforms in a few more countries, so um, you'll get the pertinent information and the appeal for funds <laughs> uh, next week. All right. So let's get into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. And it is by Maxine Bernstein at the Oregonian. Lawyers for the U.S. Department of Justice told Portland's police chief and city attorney to hand over all original unredacted training materials for the rapid response team, furious that the city did not make them aware months ago of a team training presentation that included a derogatory slide advocating violence against protesters. The letter comes just days after the city released a PowerPoint training slide showing a prayer of the alt night, a meme that uses biblical terms to urge the beating and pepper spraying of demonstrators derided as dirty hippies and advocates leaving them cuffed and stuffed and stitched and bandaged to teach them a lesson. Wow. They want to be bad daddy, don't they? Well, it's because they are. The attorneys wrote that the city of Portland should have reported the crowd control team's training presentation to the Justice Department since the city is under a consent decree. The police department consent decree. Yeah. That should have reported the crowd control team's training presentation to the Justice Department when it was developed as required by the city's eight year old use of force settlement with the federal justice or with a federal agency. Excuse me. Justice Department attorneys Jared D. Hager and R. Jonas Geisler said they were told of the inappropriate material for the first time last Thursday and that the city shared the slideshow with them only hours before the mayor's office released it to the media. They described the training slides, not just the offensive slide that was inserted at the end, as having varying degrees of offensive content, incorrect guidance, and false or misleading information. The attorney should have handed over the material to the Justice Justice Department when his office obtained them in September as discovery evidence for a pending federal lawsuit. Had the city informed us of the existence of these training materials at the time, we would have had the opportunity to provide substantial edits 
and declined to approve the training, the letter said. Some Portland Police Bureau and city employees knew or should have known about these materials for years, they wrote. The lawyers asked the city to provide the full training materials to the Justice Department by January 28th. They also want the city to provide them with periodic status reports on the ongoing police internal affairs investigation into the training slides and why the training material was withheld from the Justice Department. The circumstances behind the drafting of the inappropriate material and if and when it was used in training and who attended. In April, the Justice Department issued a formal notice to the city that it had failed to meet key reforms under the 2014 settlement, which was reached after a federal investigation found Portland officers used excessive force against people with mental illness. The federal department cited inappropriate police use and management of force during the 2020s racial justice protests, inadequate training and subpar supervision by higher ups. From May 29th of 2020 through November 15th of 2021, during the height of the protests in Portland, sparked by the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Portland police used force more than 6,000 times, according to the Justice Department report. Police sometimes targeted people who attended protests but were not involved in any violence through guilt by association or focused on people simply because they were slow walking away when ordered to disperse, federal investigators found. The Justice Department then outlined nine steps the city should take to meet the terms of the settlement, which included adoption of a body-worn camera program for all officers. The original settlement called for widespread changes to police use of force and taser policies, training, supervision and oversight, a restructuring restructuring of police crisis intervention services and quicker investigations into alleged police misconduct. Next offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speaky, is out of the Associated Press by John Anzac. A 22-year Los Angeles Fire Department veteran was nominated to become the first woman to lead the department. Deputy Chief Kristen Crowley would become the first female fire chief for the nation's second largest city if the nomination by Mayor Eric Garcetti Garcetti is confirmed by the city council. Council President Nuri Martinez joined the mayor in announcing the selection at a news conference. This is a moment for so many little girls across the city, for many of them who think you can't be what you what you can't see, Martinez said. And today the picture changes. Crowley, who currently holds the jobs of acting administrative operations chief deputy and fire marshal, said that keeping the department operationally ready would be her number one priority. Her nomination came as the fire department deals with issues ranging from the COVID-19 pandemic to claims that its female employees face bullying and harassment. We will focus on firefighter safety, physical health, and overall emotional well-being, Crowley said. As the fire chief, I vow to create and support and promote a culture that truly values diversity, inclusion, and equity within the entire organization. Harassing behavior will not be tolerated, said Crowley, who was a firefighter, paramedic, engineer, and battalion chief in the steps of her career leading up Her joining the department's command staff, Garcetti recounted how Crowley and her wife, who had just retired from the fire department, helped a family member leave Malibu Canyon during the disastrous 2018 Woolsey fire and then battled flames for 16 hours, saving nine out of 10 homes on that street. If that isn't heroism in action, I'm not sure what it is, the mayor said. 
Crowley would replace Ralph Terrazas, who became the department's first Latino chief in 2014 and promoted Crowley several times. Yen and Tom Kreischer of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. With traffic fatality spiking higher, the nation's top safety investigator says a widely cited government statistic that 94% of serious crashes are solely due to driver error is misleading and that the Transportation Department should stop using it. Jennifer Homendy, the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board, told the AP that she's surprised the wording remains on the department's website, even as the Biden administration pledges to embark on a broader strategy to stave off crashes through better road design, auto safety features, and other measures. Auto safety advocates have been calling on the department for years to stop using the statistic, including requests by Homendy in recent months, as well as a letter from auto safety groups to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg last month. They call the figure an unacceptable excuse for surging crashes. In a section touting the safety potential of automated vehicles, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's website states, 94% of serious crashes are due to human error. That has to change, Hamadi said. It's dangerous. She said the public should be enraged that nearly 40,000 people are dying annually in traffic accidents and millions are injured, but rather sees it as just a risk people take. What's happening is we have a culture that accepts it, she said. At the same time, it relieves everybody else of responsibility they have for improving safety, including the Department of Transportation, she added. You cannot simultaneously say we're focused on a safe system approach, making sure everybody who shares responsibility for road safety is taking action to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries and have a 94% number out there, which is not accurate. Responding, the board said it would update the wording on its website in the near future to address that characterization of the data as well as provide additional information. The department is slated to release next week a national strategy for steps to save lives on the roads. And that's what they're supposed to do. All right, let's get to our abbreviated break for the day. And when we get back, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take New Mover Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Joel Cohen's usual suspects. Who knew Joel Cohen had this movie in him? I mean, I should have because Cohen has shown already in his past work that he's a master of tone and pacing, unlike me, that he can create weird and beautiful worlds and that he gets great people to deliver memorable performances. And he works with Francis McDormand. But with the tragedy of Macbeth, Cohen shows what you can do when you gather good people behind the camera as well as in front. 
Cinematographer Bruno Del Bonnell was with Cohen in The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, and before that, he did Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, Inside Llewellyn Davis, and Across the Universe. He and Cohen, along with Mary Zoffries, who did costumes for the Coens in True Grit, and along with editor Lucian Johnston, also with Cohen in The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, and along with longtime Cohen composer Carter Burwell, have put out a movie that is wonderfully theatrical while simultaneously being robustly cinematic. Production designer Stéphane Deschamps, who did Call of the Wild, Welcome to Marwin, and Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, steps from his more colorful fare to handily designed for black and white. He creates lean, spare interiors and striking landscapes that become playgrounds of light and texture for Cohen and Del Bonnell to play in. And Cohen really leans into these designs, conspicuously framing actors within the lines that Deschamps has provided. Also playing with Deschamps' lines, Zoffrey's simple but evocative costumes show how much fun you can have draping people in fabric. Burwell's Stringfeld score just vibrates with tension, and Cohen does such nice things with the script, pulling out images of birds to become a visual motif, sculpting Ross into this weird liminal figure, reimagining the cauldron scene and the banquet scene, staging the best fight with Seward I've seen, and Catherine Hunter as the Weird Sisters. If you're down for a high level of overt style play, as I am, then you're in for a wonderful treat with the tragedy of Macbeth. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1973. That was the day oil, chemical, and atomic workers struck Shell Oil over health and safety issues. OCAW had been involved in lobbying for the passage of OSHA and other environmentally related acts. Their members worked in some of the most dangerous, most toxic industries in the country. By 1972, they demanded contract language for health and safety safety committees on the job. The oil company countered with accusations that improved safety proved too expensive and that OCAW used the issue to assert union control over the production process. The other oil companies eventually settled in OCAW's favor, but Shell would not budge. And so, the OCAW called a strike at eight facilities and a boycott of all Shell products. They also successfully enlisted the support of environmental organizations by stressing toxic chemicals chemical exposure and hazards faced by workers and the public alike. Picket lines were solid and thousands honored the boycott. Sales for Shell fell by 25%. After four months, the strike fund was nearly drained. Shell exploited internal divisions among members at a Texas plant and negotiated a separate settlement. What health and safety language Shell did agree to was non-binding. The union was broke and the strike ended in compromise in early June. Despite this, as historian Robert Gordon notes, OCAW was able to gain strong health and safety language at all other oil companies for the first time, heightened public awareness of health hazards confronting millions of workers, and pressured OSHA into adopting stricter standards. Perhaps more importantly, the strike solidified the tentative Labor Environmental Alliance. Having merged with the United Steelworkers, the union continues to secure safe working conditions through contracts and alliances today.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We normally begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. But since time is at a premium, we're going to jump right into weather from around the world, which is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 40 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 42 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 53 and fair. Kiev is 29 degrees with light snow. Kabul is also 29 degrees with light snow. Hong Kong is 60 degrees with light rain. Tokyo is 35 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 68 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and fair with a heavy fog advisory on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is 15, that's 1-5, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, but it is sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Danica Koto of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Puerto Rico's nearly five-year bankruptcy battle is ending after a federal judge signed a plan that slashes the U.S. territory's public debt load as part of a restructuring and allows the government to start repaying creditors. The plan marks the largest municipal debt restructuring in U.S. history and was approved following grueling bargaining efforts, heated hearings, and multiple delays as the island struggles to recover from deadly hurricanes, earthquakes, and a pandemic that deepened its economic crisis. There has never been a public restructuring like this anywhere in America or in the world, said David Skeel, chairman of the Federal Control Board, appointed to oversee Puerto Rico's finances that has worked with the judge on the plan. He noted that no bankruptcy mechanisms exist for countries or U.S. states like the one Puerto Rico was granted. This was an astonishingly complex and large and important bankruptcy, Skeel said, noting that the island had three times as much debt as Detroit, Michigan. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. This final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Edith M. Letterer. The UN General Assembly approved a resolution condemning any denial of the Holocaust and urging all nations and social media companies to take active measures to combat anti Semitism and Holocaust denial. Or distortion. The 193 member world body approved the resolution by consensus, meaning without a vote, and with a bang of a gavel by Assembly President Abdullah Shahid, who met with a group of Holocaust survivors before the Assembly meeting. 
Israel's number one enemy, Iran, disassociated itself from the resolution. The ambassadors of Israel and Germany, which strongly supported the resolution, stressed the significance of the resolution's adoption on January 20th. It is the 80th anniversary of the Wanna See conference where Nazi leaders coordinated plans for the so-called final solution of the Jewish question at a villa on the shores of Berlin's Wanna See Lake in 1942 during World War II. The result was the establishment of Nazi death camps and the murder of nearly six million Jews comprising one-third of the Jewish people. In addition, millions of people from other nationalities, minorities, and targeted groups were killed according to the resolution. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But we will meet up here on Monday for... River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Don't even